the case prepared for us, which um, which is bound to be a good one. I suspect that Travis has been uh, has had his hands in the case preparation in some way, which always makes for a really interesting case. Um, and unless there's somebody who is like particularly excited about discussing today, we're going to sort of go with the like the um, the general format of like solving and thinking through the case together. So if you um, uh, for those of you who have maybe been here with me recently, that involves basically all of us sharing our thoughts in the chat, sharing your thinking out loud if you like to. If people want to um, uh, uh, unmute and share their thinking out loud, that would be fantastic. And if you drop a particularly poignant teaching pearl in the chat or something that seems like it's on the sense of the case, I may call on you to share your reasoning more out loud as well. Um, uh, if you're not in a place to be able to, to unmute, that's totally fine. But really the hope is that we get a, as many voices represented in the case, because as we always say, clinical reasoning and diagnosis is a team sport. And so we're gonna be one big team of 27 people today as we get a chance to think through the case. Before we get started, I want to give a chance for everybody who's going to be handling things like striving, teaching points, and presenting the case to introduce themselves. So maybe we can start with you, Franco, um, just to introduce yourself and what your role is going to be today. Hi, everybody. I'm Franco. I'm a Peruvian physician, and I'm be doing teaching point today. Maybe I can come to you next, Kelly. Hey everyone, I'm Kelly. I'm a fourth year medical student at LECOM Bradenton and I will be presenting the case today. Bill? Hi friends, my name is Bill. I'm also from LECOM and I'm a fourth year going into neurology and I'll be scribing today. And then a CPS obviously member who needs no introduction, Rafa. Hi everyone, my name is Rafael and I'm a Malaysia medical student from Brazil and I'm here just for the support and to learn from this amazing group. Rafa is also being very humble. You may have seen on Twitter recently, but Rafa and Maria have both stepped into a new leadership role within the CP Solvers and are going to be basically directors of non-podcast related projects. So um, uh, con continuing their ascent to greatness in the, in the clinical reasoning space. We're so proud of you, Rafa. Congratulations. And to Maria, who's not here today physically, but is here in spirit. And then Brody, I see you're also here as well. Do you mind uh, uh, just... In introducing yourself as I think an audience participant today, but also a core CP Solvers team member. Hey, hello everyone. Good morning. Yeah, I'm so uh, uh, happy to be here. I'm actually traveling, so I'm not be share my video, but I'm traveling to my sisters in the East Bay and uh, to spend for Christmas. So yeah, I'm just going to be listening in and be participating if possible. Yeah. Right well, it's great to see you, Brody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd love to hear, but before we get before we get started in the case, is there anybody for whom this is your first time at CP Solvers VMR? Oh, I see Catherine. Well, Catherine, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, and uh, yeah, again, feel free to share your thoughts in the chat, um, and we will hopefully um, get a whole host of individuals. Um, a whole host of individuals contributing, but always, always a joy to have um, to have uh, a first timer and welcome to the CP Solvers community. You are officially stuck with us now. You come to one to one VMR and you're automatically a part of the family. Um, well, I will stop stalling and turn it over to you, Kelly, um, to get us to get us started with the case. But Bill, feel free to take over the screen. All right, so first off, our chief concern, we have an 80-year-old male presenting with lightheadedness, diarrhea, and weight loss. Um, so I'll just go into the HPI. He presented with three weeks of worsening non-bloody diarrhea and 30-pound weight loss over one year. Uh, he describes having intermittent watery diarrhea over the last six months but the frequency and volume of the diarrhea has increased over the last three weeks. It is non-bloody. Um, he reports crampy, non-radiating epigastric abdominal pain with decreased oral intake out of fear of it causing him to have more diarrhea. Um, he has also felt lightheaded upon standing up from the toilet this morning or the morning presentation, which is the reason why he went to the emergency room for further evaluation. Um, and then just kind of other review of systems. He denies fevers and night sweats. He denies nausea and vomiting, um, denies chest pain and palpitations, and then denies dysuria and hematuria. 
Um, kind of some other things he doesn't associate it with or he had didn't hasn't noticed any like pattern as far as foods um, and then he hasn't eaten anything new recently as well no change in diet um yeah I think that's good for the first aliquot today so you've given us plenty to chew on here Kelly thank you um, um I'm already seeing some thoughts flying in the chat really focusing on the diarrhea here um Rafa maybe I can I can I can come to you if you're if you're comfortable sharing. I think you've given sort of a fantastic initial structure of an approach to chronic diarrhea, which is the label that we can put on this patient's clinical syndrome that he's presenting with here. So Rafa, do you mind sharing um, sharing a little bit more? Yeah, so when we have a patient with more than four weeks having diarrhea, we have to think about chronic diarrhea. And then we can divide that into two buckets, inflammatory and non-inflammatory causes. Inflammatory could see things like I, uh, bloody in the bloody diarrhea and also fecalicocytes, systemic manifestations, and non inflammatory. Uh, you, you have to think about inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Non inflammatory cause, we could divide that into secretory and osmotic. And history here is very important because when you have secretory diarrhea, the patients have um, diarrhea, even if they're not fasting, even if they're fasting, I'm sorry. So they wake up in the middle of the night with diarrhea and it's not associated with um, lunch or any other food, which is the opposite of osmotic diarrhea. That's a fantastic summary, Rafa. I, um, uh, I have nothing to add in terms of the phenomenal breakdown here, but I'll just sort of comment briefly on some of, some of, the, some of the other elements in the case, and I think a general clinical reasoning strategy that we can deploy, right? In this case, we have somebody who came in with lightheadedness, diarrhea, and weight loss, and what Rafa did is Rafa has, has already focused the center of gravity on the diarrhea, right? And there's a number of different ways we can approach in our own clinical thinking, um, uh, multiple, multiple chief concerns at once, right? We can sort of pursue each of these chief concerns in parallel, right? So we might think about reasons that someone could have weight loss. We might think about reasons that someone could be lightheaded and then think about reasons that someone could have diarrhea. But we can also ask the question of, are, are any of these symptoms explained by the other symptom? And I think we can see here, right, we can easily explain lightheadedness by the presence of diarrhea, and we can explain weight loss by some of the history Kelly gave us in terms of how this gentleman has been handling or trying to self-manage his underlying, his underlying diarrhea by decreasing his, his oral intake. Right. So in this case here, right, we can see, at, at least in this first aliquot, the diarrhea is the center of gravity for one, because we can explain the other symptoms by the presence of the diarrhea. But then, but then two is also that we can have a, um, a little bit more of, of a narrow differential as we think about the diarrhea, right? The list of things that cause light, lightheadedness can be exhaustive, and the list of things that cause weight loss can also be quite high. But one hypothesis that we have to be open to here, given the time course, is that there is actually a, um, something maybe potentially outside of the GI tract that's causing the diarrhea and the weight loss. Because we see here that it seems like there was weight loss over a year and then diarrhea over the last six months. So is there something that was brewing before the diarrhea started that could have led to the development of diarrhea in this case? I think for now, we're gonna focus our cognitive energy on the center of gravity, which is the diarrhea. And, and, and try to better characterize it, right? Diarrhea can be a really enormous chief concern. So oftentimes we add things like different adjectives in front of the diarrhea to help, to help better understand it. In this case, Rafa has already given us some adjectives like chronic, and then we're gonna use elements of the history to decide whether this is inflammatory, secretory, or osmotic. As Rafa said, right, if we find that these, that if we get history from Kelly that these episodes are waking the patient up at night, we might start to think about a secretory cause. If we find that, that there have been prominent systemic inflammatory symptoms, right, that might push us into the inflammatory category, right? I will say like, sometimes you may hear that, that abdominal pain plus diarrhea puts you in the inflammatory category. And I will say in practice, right, many individuals who are having diarrhea from any cause can have vague, nonspecific, crampy abdominal pain. So in this case, I think the jury is still out as to whether or not we're dealing with an inflammatory, a secretory, an osmotic, or a fatty cause of diarrhea, those being the four big categories of chronic diarrhea. And we'll just have to wait to get more information about his clinical syndrome to start to localize that, right? Um, and so as we go through, right, looking at the abdominal exam, thinking more about the history here, as we hopefully tease out 
what is the underlying driver of this patient's diarrhea. But again, I think we have to be open to the hypothesis that maybe the center of this case is in the GI tract, but maybe there's actually something more systemic happening that, um, um, that is just causing diarrhea in addition to a whole host of other clinical manifestations we may uncover. So um, those are the things that I'm currently tracking right now, and I'll turn it over to Kelly for a little bit more. Yeah, so I will go into additional history and the physical exam. So past medical history, he has coronary artery disease, um, CKD stage 3A, MGUS diagnosed in 2015, and erythrodermic psoriasis. Surgical history, he had one drug eluding stent to the um, RCA in 2005. Family history, he has a maternal history of hypertension and heart failure. Paternal history of hypertension as well. Um, doo -doo -doo. Medications, he's taking aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, amlodipine, 5 milligrams daily, carvedilol, 25 milligrams, BID, atorvastatin, 40 milligrams, protonics, 40 milligrams, tamsulosin. And then social, he denies um, smoking tobacco, drinking alcohol, or illicit drug use. He has not had any recent travel and no recent illnesses. Occupation, he is a retired mechanical engineer. And then on physical exam, his temperature is 36.8 degrees Celsius, heart rate 75, respiratory rate 18. Blood pressure, 112 over 75. Oxygen saturation, 99% on room air. General, he is in no acute distress and um, conversant. HENT, um, pupils equal and reactive to light and accommodation. No thyromegaly or nodules. Normal dentition, no oral ulcers. Lungs cleared auscultation bilaterally without um, wheezing, Rawls, Ronchi. Cardiovascularly regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. No bilateral lower extremity edema. Abdomen, soft, non-tender to palpation, non-distended. Bowel sounds present in all four quadrants musculoskeletal, normal range of motion, strength is four out of five um, in all extremities, but equal. And then skin, a pyritic plaque-like rash located on the extensor surface of bilateral upper and lower extremities and thoracic back. And that Kelly. is it for that aliquot. Yeah. Can you describe that rash again? Yeah, pyritic and plaque-like located on the extensor surface of bilateral upper and lower extremities and thoracic back. Amazing. Kelly, I just want to applaud what is um, what has been an, clearly an incredibly thoughtful case preparation. And uh, I just, I appreciate so much um, the ways in which you have been, that you're sort of outlining this case. And I can imagine that it, that it is directly simulating the challenges that the evaluating clinicians face when, the, when, um, when, they, were, when they were seeing this patient. Um, I'm seeing a couple awesome thoughts coming, coming through the chat here. The first one coming from Hans and sort of, and sort of highlighting some of the um, uh, um, potent elements of this patient's background medical history that are that are, that are jumping out, particularly the MGUS. Hans, could I maybe come to you to share a, a little bit more about what you were thinking in terms of this patient's MGUS and how you're potentially linking it to the underlying presence of diarrhea? Yes. <clears throat> uh, when I saw MGUS, we have uh, lots of immunoglobulins. I think it's immunoglobulin M in his circulation. And that could secondarily lead to something like a vasculitis or an, a protein losing enteropathy. We have had a similar case earlier in, in our VMRs. So that could probably be one reason for his 
uh, diarrhea. So it's very interesting to see his labs later on. Yeah. So the MGAS is interesting to see here. Yeah, I think it's a fan fantastic point. I see Kashal sharing some excellent thoughts about the rash. Kashal, would you maybe be up to share a little bit more about your comments in terms of the rash, but then also some of the other elements you're bringing in, like the PPI um, and C. diff? Sure, Jack. Uh, so what I was wondering was, as Hans mentioned that uh, in the chat, uh, it, it, the rash can be like psoriasis, but uh, the other thing I was thinking was it, it's pruritic. And uh, when I hear about pruritic rash with diarrhea, I think about celiac disease and dermatitis herpetiformis, but usually the rash is less like plaque and more like vesicular. Uh, and I was looking at the medication list and PPI can definitely increase the risk of C. diff. Uh, and other thing that I can think of with uh, amlodipine is uh, it can cause Ogilvy syndrome, the uh, uh, pseudo obstruction, but it wouldn't present with these symptoms. Uh, yeah, that, that's what my thoughts are so far. I was hoping that I would see Losartan and uh, use, use, uh, we had a case presented by Anne Murray with Losartan and Tropopy. Uh, but the patient is not taking any losartan or even ACE inhibitors can cause that. Excellent. I think it's a fantastic point that you're bringing up here. And, 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 and I think everybody that we're seeing, whether it's Hans, Rafa, Bronco, um, uh, I think it's sort of, again, sort of trying to find ways that we can link elements of the past medical history into this current, into this current presentation here. Um, Colleen, I see you, you also are highlighting what I think is a super important question, even if we don't don't necessarily have the answer to it. I think it's a critical question in this case. Do you mind un unmuting and share a little share a little bit more about sort of why you feel like this question is particularly important in terms of whether or not the rash has changed? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, sorry, my dog is making a lot of noise in the background. Um, What's your dog's name? Uh, his name is Yali. Oops. Hi, Yali. Um, apologize for that. Okay, he yeah. left. Uh, I I guess yeah. I was thinking. Um, I think like diarrhea plus rash is, you know, is very specific. Um, compared to what we started with, and um, I think that that would take me on like a very specific, like a more specific path than like someone who just has diarrhea. Um. I don't have like a ton of specific things. I think um, like celiac disease was one of the things I was thinking about, but you could think more about other things that present with diarrhea and rash too. But um, my suspicion is this is probably just his baseline. Yes, I love it. Colin, I think um, again, like, like this is one of the core challenges of the clinical reasoning process. You all may have heard Gupreet Dhaliwal's presentation on Monday, but one of, one of the quotes that was highlighted, I don't think I'll, I'll do justice to the quote, which, but was that like, I think it was like the mark of, of, of intelligence, which I will not claim to have, is the ability to hold in our head two competing diagnoses and still be able to function, right? And I think what, what, what we're doing here is holding multiple different competing di diagnoses at once, right? How can, like, is potentially the history of the MGUS related to the diarrhea? Well, how can we explore that hypothesis, right? MGUS can have complications, of it, whether it's progression to multiple myeloma or the development of light chain amyloidosis. Um, light chain amyloidosis can involve the GI tract, and maybe that's one way that, that we can make MGUS on the hook for the diarrhea here, right? The other sort of hypothesis that we're exploring is like, is the rash part of the center of gravity of the case, or is it just a bystander symptom here, right? We have a plausible explanation for, for a puritic rash on the extensor surfaces, in the known history of psoriasis, right? So do we incorporate the rash into our problem representation and say that the cause of this patient's diarrhea must explain also the patient's rash? Or do we say, oh, oh actually the rash is just a bystander and we're still just gonna focus this on a diarrhea case. As the group mentioned, right? If we fold rash into our problem representation and say that, say that, that this is a diarrhea plus rash case, there's a number of ways that we can potentially get there, right? There's some nutritional deficiencies that can be a complication of diarrhea that can cause a rash, right? You may have heard of pellagra or niacin deficiency as one example. There's also ways in which, in, in which underlying malignancies in the GI tract 
can lead to the development of skin findings. There are certain colon cancers that are associated with, with, with specific characteristic rashes, right? So we're going to be tracking these two things in parallel. Is this a purely, a purely diarrhea case? Is this a diarrhea case in the setting of somebody who has a monoclonal gammopathy? Is this a diarrhea case plus a rash case? And how can we start to move those things forward? At this point now, I don't feel comfortable putting any of those hypotheses outside of my head. But I think, right, the probably the most reasonable one from an epidemiologic standpoint is to say that this is still a diarrhea case. We're still looking at these different categories of an inflammatory diarrhea, a secretory diarrhea, an osmotic process, or fatty diarrhea, and see how we can sort of, again, maybe fold these less probable diagnoses into our minds, given some of these other features that we have, like the rash and like the MDES. The question then becomes, well, where do we go from here, right? If we're going to be thinking about our options for evaluating this patient's chronic diarrhea, we can look for sort of non-specific non markers that may push us into one category. For example, if we see an ongoing leukocytosis or super high inflammatory markers, that might push us into the inflammatory side. Whereas if we can, we can look at certain stool studies to get a sense of, to sort of better, to better characterize whether this is an osmotic or a secretory diarrhea or an inflammatory diarrhea. If we see lots of white cells in the stools or a high fecal calprotectin that could put us in the inflammatory category. And then we might rely on other more targeted diagnostics, things like cross-sectional imaging or colonoscopy if we feel like our workup is ultimately unrevealing. But most of the time where we're gonna start is non-invasive methods of better characterizing this patient's diarrhea. So that'll be serum studies, like basic labs um, uh, and stool studies to get a sense of, again, still having to sort of focus this process on whether or not, or on, on what category of, di of diarrhea that Rafa explained are we potentially dealing with. And again, I think the jury is still out on, on, on whether the rash becomes a part of the center of gravity of the case or not. But at this point, just based off of the base rate of disease, I'm sort of having that more peripherally in my brain because diarrhea plus rash diagnoses are much less common than the other causes of chronic diarrhea that we haven't yet excluded in the process so far. And it seems like we got this interesting historical question from Kelly that the diarrhea happens all throughout the day, but doesn't necessarily wake him up at night, um, which is which maybe which we could say maybe decreases the probability of a secretory process slightly, but I think we'll still have to see how things how things unfold. So Kelly, why don't you take us through the next step? All right, amazing discussion, everyone. So up next, I have initial labs and just some initial imaging for everyone. Um, white, or we'll start with the CBC. White blood count is 10, which is normal. Hemoglobin is 12.5, which is slightly low. Lower range of normal is 12.8. Platelets are 215,000 normal. Um, Sodium, 135, normal. Potassium is 3.3, which is slightly low. Low um, normal is 3.5. Chloride, 106, which is normal. Bicarb is 18, which is low. BUN is 23, normal. Creatinine is 2.78, which is elevated. Glucose is 104. And... Calcium is nine, which is normal. AST is 20, normal. ALT, 35, normal. Um, total Billy is 1.1, which is normal. Alkfos is 130, slightly elevated. Total protein, 6.2, slightly low. Um, low normal is 6.4. And then albumin is 2.8, which is low. I have a UA, which everything turned out negative. <laughs> um, lactic acid is 1.7. CRP is 4. ESR is 70. TSH is 2.12. And then I have a CT abdomen pelvis with and without contrast that showed diffuse fluid and gas filled small and large bowel loops concerning for enteritis. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kelly. Can I ask you one, one question? Is this patient's creatinine, is this markedly elevated from baseline or is this about where, where, where things have been? It's not markedly elevated for baseline. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it seems like, so, 
really then, I guess the sort of, it seems like the key findings that we have here is this imaging findings. So it sounds like diffuse fluid and gas buildup throughout, you said loops of small bowel, um, or was it, or was it of, of the colon? Um, Could you just repeat the entire uh, CPAP? Yeah. Make sure you're right. Yeah, I have diffuse fluid and gas filled small and large bowel loops. It doesn't really delineate past that. Does it say the second half here or is it just the up until large bowel loops? Concerning for large bowel enteritis, was that, did I hear that or is that not? Yeah, diffuse fluid and gas filled small and large bowel loops concerning for enteritis. That's it. Okay. So I'm curious to hear from, from those of you in the audience, how you all are thinking about these underlying, these underlying imaging findings. I'm seeing some, some people mentioning HIV. Shreya, I'm curious if I could, if I could turn to, turn to you to share a little bit more about sort of, of, of sort of what are the things that are bringing HIV into the fold for you here? So I think uh, like with uh, with HIV, we see um, um, the dysoriatic like plaques and diarrhea because plaques and diarrhea that struck my mind with the HIV, but his WBC count seems normal. So I'm not sure whether to consider that or not. Uh, um, so yeah, that 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 is why I thought, okay, maybe HIV. Excellent, excellent point here. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so right, like the finding here again of the sort of of, of enteritis tells us that there's that what what seems like there's something inflammatory happening within the GI tract, and then I'm also seeing Vale and Kashal mentioning sort of the link of the HIV and the and the psoriasis here, um, and then also many, many other potential links here with the psoriasis and the potential GI findings. Um, and then I think Colleen is bringing up a really important point here about thinking about something that's more infectious in general, right? Um, and so asking questions about immune status, travel exposures, and things like that. It seems like there, there, there hasn't been recent no, no travel and no, no recent illness. And so I think then like the question is, is how do we start, start, start to walk forward these these imaging findings here, right? If we're seeing enteritis or inflammation within the intestinal tract, then basically, um, um, I think, right, we can we can sort of rely on our schema for diseases that can cause an inflammatory process, right? So we can think about infections, we can think about underlying malignancy, we can think about underlying autoimmune disease, and then also there's sort of rare things, whether it's drugs or and or um, and endocrinopathy here, right? So if we were to explore infection, this would probably have to be a chronic indolent infection in this gentleman that's characterized by, by issues within the GI tract and a, and a clinical syndrome of weight loss, as well as being associated with a rash, right? If we, if we sort of go through our schema in terms, of, in terms of thinking about infections that can do this, right? We can think about the viral category, but that's usually a self, um, that's usually a self limited process. We could think about the bacterial category, things like, things like Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, but again, those are usually going to be a shorter time, um, a shorter time course, and usually characterized by there being the presence of bloody diarrhea. Indolent categories of infection, maybe things like mycobacterial disease, although we don't have a huge risk factor for this, and parasitic infections, which we will oftentimes associate with travel um, to areas in which they are endemic, which we don't seem like we have in this case, but there are some, but there are some potentially sexually transmitted um, um, uh, parasitic infections and ones that. That, that can be acquired um, at least here within the United States. Other indolent chronic infections of the GI tract that could cause a, clinic, um, uh, a more chronic presentation like this include something like Whipple's disease, which is incredibly rare, but something that is very, very often invoked in these cases. Um, and so I think, right, like, like certainly reasonable to bring, that, to bring that into the fold right now, but important to remember that it sort of overall has a lower base rate. Then if we move into the next category, right? Because again, the longer a, the longer a syndrome lasts, the the um, the more we decrease the probability of infection and bring other things into the fold, like a malignancy or an autoimmune disease, right? We could have right the there's a number of malignancies that can impact the GI tract and cause chronic diarrhea, 
but the DDX narrows slightly when we have a more diffuse finding, right? If, if, if there was a, col a, for example, a colonic adenocarcinoma or a small bowel tumor that we picked up on CT scan, we would usually expect that to be a focal mass rather than necessarily the finding of a more diffuse inflammatory process, right? And so, um, uh, but it's, um, I should say cancers that could do this could be something like a, col a colonic adenocarcinoma. There's a number of different small bowel tumors. We oftentimes see neuroendocrine tumors present within, within, the, within the small bowel. Um, and those could be potentially hormone secreting tumors, right? So, so things like um, carcinoid syndrome, gastronomas, something called a VIP-OMA, which is a tumor that can cause uh, basal, uh, a tumor that produces vasointestinal peptide, and that can cause a profuse watery diarrhea syndrome, right? So neuro, neuroendocrine tumors are certainly reasonable to think about here if we're going to invoke malignancy. And then it's also important not to forget about lymphoma, right? This is an, an elderly gentleman with a non, with a, what sounds like a chronic indolent illness that's now having GI manifestations and lymphoma can also do it, right? So, so far we've talked about the infections that can do it. We've talked about cancers that can do it, whether it's colon cancer, small bowel tumors of which we have to think about the neuro, the neuroendocrine subtype of small bowel tumors and then potentially lymphoma. And then we have to ask ourselves about potential underlying autoimmune disease, right? IBD, not characteristically manifesting in somebody of this, of this age, um, um, but there is sort of a peak later in life. So something like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we may think about, but we don't see many of the classic features here, right? Those are usually going to be a bloody diarrhea. And if it's Crohn's disease, it's going to be sort of um, uh, uh, having flares and we might see characteristic imaging findings that we don't see. Ulcerative colitis is plausible here, but again, should be a bloody diarrhea process. And we would expect usually purely colitis rather than enteritis, which is, it sounds like what we're seeing here on the CT scan with, with involvement of the small bowel. Um, and then one, one, one other sort of immune mediated process to think about that can cause a chronic diarrhea is microscopic colitis, which is a diagnosis that usually has to be made on endoscopy via biopsy, where you'll see like a dense lymphocytic infiltrate there. Um, and then I think two other categories that I always ask myself about when I see small, when I, when I, when I see bowel, bowel inflammation, um, is the ischemic category and also the, the infiltrative category, right? So for example, diseases like ischemic colitis um, can manifest with bowel, with bowel inflammation, but oftentimes are not going to have this, this long of a tempo and also oftentimes won't have diarrhea. Those will usually be diarrhea-free processes. So ischemic colitis seems like it's less likely here. And then the last one is infiltrative diseases, right? So thinking about something like amyloid or an infiltrative malignancy like lymphoma here. If this was amyloidosis, right? We talked about it earlier because there, because there, because there is MGUS, right? That can certainly secrete light chains that could deposit within the GI tract. Um, but it's, it's also important to note that we don't see other organs being impacted, right? We don't see proteinuria um, uh, uh, in this patient's urinalysis, which could be a su suggestive of there being amyloid deposits in the kidneys. And we don't have things like neurologic manifestations, which we can also sometimes see. So that was a really, really long list, which is just to capture that the jur that this is a challenging diagnosis to make at this point without taking a look inside the GI tract, right? We know that there is inflammation there within, it seems like pr primarily the, um, the small bowel, but there may also be colonic involvement. And so I would be curious just to clarify with Kelly, did they mention that the colon is inflamed or just the small bowel is inflamed? Uh, both. Oh, okay. So that's that's helpful to know because we may be able to take a look at, 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 at what's happening with an endoscopy, right? So that could be a helpful next step. If we were to sort of prioritize those categories we talked about, infections, malignancy, autoimmune disease, I would put infections a little bit lower, bring malignancy up a little bit higher, um, and then also sort of sort of have have also autoimmune disease in the fold here. But given that it's been such, such an, an, an indolent presentation, I think we have to think about underlying cancers, but then also things like microscopic colitis. And we're certainly gonna, gonna do testing for the chronic infections that we mentioned here. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Kelly. That was a long-winded way of saying, I'm not sure what's going on, but those are some of, some of the categories of diseases that we can include and some sample diagnoses to put in that category. So I think we'll have some time to go into another chunk of labs and then um, do one more aliquot after that, which will reveal the final diagnosis. Um, so, and then we will get some of your stool studies, Rafa.
Um, so additional labs, C. diff PCR was negative, HIV PCR negative, ANA negative, Two sets of blood cultures were taken and they were both negative. Um, fecal leukocyte stain, ova and parasites, salmonella, shigella, campylobacter, and cryptosporidium antigen were all negative. Uh, pancreatic elastase, one negative. Fecal pH was eight, which is slightly alkalinic with osmolality of 404, which is high, um, but Rafa, no stool, awesome, yeah, sad. Um, fecal fat, negative, uh, a urine, 5-H-I-A-A, negative, anti-centromere, negative, anti-SSA and SSB, negative, and anti-SCL70, um, also negative. Uh, chromogranin A negative, and then VIP or vasoactive intestinal peptide was also negative and no calprotectin. And then um, the last aliquot will reveal the final diagnosis. Amazing. Thank you so much. Like, again, I just want to have it right. Like this is so such a wonderful hypothesis driven presentation here. Like we ask for all kinds of things in the DDX of, of, um, of chronic diarrhea, and you just gave us so many of those helpful lab tests here. Um, um, I see a couple, a couple other questions here in the chat. Kashal asking, has, um, was, there, was there any testing for celiac done yet? And, it, and it, if, that's, if that's just not available at this time, that's totally okay. It's brewing in the lab. Right. All right. And so, um, um, I'm going to also then um, just just sort of open it up to the chat for any any other thoughts here in terms of this long extensive list of negative of negative tests so far. Well, I will say right. I think we've ha we've had this has been really helpful in ruling out many of the diagnoses that we mentioned. Right, we didn't have a high suspicion. For things like bacterial infections or things like C. diff, because it has been such a long, long time course. Um, but the C. diff, right? But many of these um, infectious stool studies coming back negative is helpful. The other things that are helpful here is in terms of thinking about whether or not there is potentially an underlying neuroendocrine tumor. For those of you who um, uh, may be mystified by some of these abbreviations here in this lab test, urine 5HIAA is testing that can be helpful in looking up and um, looking for. Um, uh, um, carcinoid syndrome or tumors that may be secreting serotonin um, uh, uh, and, and um, causing some of the symptoms, which we can see like chronic diarrhea and a rash. And then the chromogranin A is another neuroendocrine tumor specific serum marker that can be helpful for at least decreasing the probability of a neuroendocrine tumor. Here, right? It doesn't necessarily rule it out as we know that there's so many serum markers for tumors are notoriously insensitive, right? But potentially is an argument against those being um, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the final diagnosis here. And so I think where we're left at now is to consider, right, infection seems like we have drastically decreased the probability of it. Malignancy, at least the neuroendocrine tumor category seems less likely here, but potentially um, uh, other tumors, which if we were to evaluate them on, on colonoscopy could be present. But again, it would, be, it would be a pretty atypical presentation for a malignancy to have ex such extensive bowel wall inflammation. That would probably leave us with some of the infiltrating malignancies, for example, like lymphoma, which can hit the GI tract. And then we're left with this specter of autoimmunity in an 80-year-old man, right? And we oftentimes think about autoimmune disease as being um, something that we see in sort of maybe individuals in their early to middle age. But it's important to remember that um, uh, uh, there are many of them that can have a peak later in life. And if we think about which of the autoimmune gastrointestinal diseases can have a peak later in life, that can include inflammatory bowel disease, but then also potentially celiac disease. And again, there's also the diagnoses that we mentioned in terms of something like microscopic colitis, which can present in middle-aged or older adults with a chronic watery diarrhea, with a chronic watery diarrhea syndrome. And so I think the question then is, is, is how are we ultimately going to make the final diagnosis here? Is it going to be serum testing for something like celiac disease? 
which is certainly reasonable in somebody who has had a syndrome of diarrhea and weight loss, right? It might be unexpected in somebody who's 80, but certainly not implausible. And the base rate of disease makes us, forces us to at least falsify the celiac hypothesis before we entertain some of these other rare diagnoses, things like microscopic colitis or some of the underlying malignancy. So that's one way that we can get a diagnosis based on serum testing. The other way that we're gonna ultimately do this is gonna be making a diagnosis based off of endoscopic findings, whether that's just what we see on gross endoscopy or with a pathologic diagnosis from biopsy specimens. And that could be something like an underlying malignancy or a diagnosis of something like, like microscopic colitis. I'm not at a point where I can say like it is 100% going, going to be any, any of those um, uh, potential underlying diagnoses, but those are some of the things that are at least racketing around in my head. And I see Hans mentioning that it's important to not forget about Whipple's disease, which is again, one of the infections that we may make on an, on an ultimate, um, uh, ultimately on lower endoscopy here. So I feel like that's, um, that's, that's, that's where we may be headed here unless there's a blood test that comes back that gives us a clear answer, which I think celiac is, is one of the blood tests that could potentially do that. Um, so I'm curious to hear sort of where, where things went, went from here, Kelly. Was it serum testing that unlocked the key or was it potentially something like, an, like um, uh, endoscopic findings that gave away the, the final diagnosis? But I'll sort of say like, I think so one of those diseases, whether it's celiac, microscopic colitis or um, an infiltrated malignancy like lymphoma would be the things that I would be thinking about. And then we may be um, we may be in for a real treat if we see the rare but always invoked diagnosis of Whipple's disease in, in uh, particularly in these clinical problem solving cases. So a lot of requests for a colonoscopy. We don't have a colonoscopy, but we do have those blood tests and an EJD. So tissue transglutaminase IgG was normal. Tissue transglutaminase IgA was 103.3, which was elevated. And then on EGD, there was a widely patent Schottsky ring gastritis with hemorrhage and erythematous duodenopathy. There was a duodenal biopsy um, done that demonstrated intraepithelial lymphocytosis, villous atrophy, and mild acute inflammation. So the final diagnosis was celiac disease in an 80 year old. Amazing, right? And so, I, like, this is, I would say, um, like this is a, a final diagnosis that feels both surprising, but also unsurprising at the same time. The reason that it feels surprising is because our illness script for celiac disease usually does not extend into this, into this late of an age range, but it's also not surprising just given the overall base rate of underlying celiac disease, right? I think we're, we are also learning more and more that it probably impacts more individuals than we previously realized, right? So our our sort of like who in the illness script, we have to be open to this being outside of the typical age ranges that we may see. And certainly, certainly 80 year olds, and, uh, uh, certainly celiac in an 80 year old is very plausible. And then the other thing that I think is, 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 um, is important to reflect on here again, is that the base rate of disease is always going to be so important, right? A very, very densely or um, uh, an epidemiologically common disease is more likely to have an atypical presentation than a very rare disease is to have is to have a typical presentation. So I would say like I sort of is both like wow, celiac in an in an eight year old, I'm surprised, but as I reflect on it more, it also seems totally totally plausible here. Um, and so I just want to say thank you again, Kelly, for a, for an absolutely fantastic case case presentation here. Um, and yeah, I'm very, I'm curious to hear if there's any, re any reflections from the group on this case, feel free to, to, to unmute and share, um, and share your thoughts out loud as you reflect back on this. I have a couple of just like wrap up things that I wanted to mention too. Um, he started gluten-free diet and was doing fine. His diarrhea resolved. Um, so right. We think that we associate celiac disease with more of a younger, um, population, but actually 25% are diagnosed in the seventh decade uh, with the delaying diagnosis of more than 10 years. And in the elderly, it usually accompanies with weight loss and nutritional def deficiencies, most commonly iron, um, but also calcium and fat soluble vitamins. So if I could go back and do some other things, I would have also um, gotten some vitamin testing. Um, but yeah, I didn't know that celiac was that like commonly diagnosed in elderly people. So yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, Kelly, um, in terms of the rash, was that, was that ultimately thought to be a manifestation of his underlying psoriasis, or was it thought to potentially be um, a cutaneous manifestation of celiac disease? It was thought to be due to his underlying psoriasis. 
right? So I think like one, one, one thing that I'm reflecting on here is that we had the specter of, of, of autoimmunity invoked in a case in terms of the patient's underlying psoriasis, which um, uh, is something that, that, to, that to be honest, I probably didn't, didn't incorporate into thinking about my risk in, in terms of thinking about the risk for underlying celiac disease enough. But I think, right, where there is autoimmunity, it may beget other autoimmunity. And so the psoriasis here, if we look at the things in the, if we sort of retrospectively look at the past medical history, the psoriasis was probably an important modifying factor in terms of thinking for the risk of underlying autoimmune mediated gastrointestinal disease. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna now turn it over to Franco who has done a incredible job of curating teaching points today to ultimately take us home with the teaching points. Well, I love the case, it was amazing. So the teaching points for today. Uh, first, we kind of uh, developed the, the process of thinking about diarrhea plus an adjective. So it always it's good to pair diarrhea with some adjective that can help us go to or schemas or to diagnosis process. So tempo is always one of the first thing that we talk about diarrhea, chronic versus acute. We can also use the schema of inflammatory versus non-inflammatory or diarrhea plus meta exposure in the case of the PPI and the CD uh, risk. Also, uh, when we think about chronic diarrhea, inflammatory versus non-inflammatory is a good is a, a to-go approach, but we should never miss the alarm signs. If it is nocturnal, if it awakens the, pa the patient at night, the age of onset, or if it is any associated pathological weight loss. If it's non-inflammatory plus, cr plus chronic, we have the big three, secretory, osmotic, and fatty, then we can also pair the area with rash that can be a little uh, broad diagnostic process with no so, frequ no so frequently than the others, but we have celiac, pellagra, colon cancer, zinc deficiency, HTLV and HIV infection. We can also pair the area, uh, chronic diarrhea plus inflammatory. And then we have like in indolent infections, whipple disease, T tuberculosis, parasitic ones, viral XCMV, HSV radiation exposure, and if the time courses get for longer, we, can, we should mention the things like IVD, malignancy, colon cancer, lymphoma, or neuroendocrine processes. We should also think outside the box and think about inflammatory 2.0, ischemic or other autoimmune process that can be taking into account or infiltration process. And finally, we learned that we, when we see um, a DC, we need to know the base rate of that. And sometimes we think about it is only the tip of the iceberg and we don't know if there is a lot of more base rate of the disease than we previously talked about in this case. Amazing. Well, there is, is more teaching points flying in the chat. Franco, thank you so much for a fantastic summary of the case. I wanna thank everybody who joined us today. I had a ton of fun, learned an incredible amount um, from getting to think through this case with all of you. I just wanna thank you again, Kelly, for bringing such a fantastic case today. This was an absolute blast. Um, I hope everybody has a great, great rest of the afternoon or rest of the day. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you back on VMR tomorrow. Thanks so much, everybody.